Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for attending this meeting. Uh, today, we have three uh, highly distinguished guests. We are going to be discussing the developments uh, as it pertains to the new Israeli government, uh, pegged as the most far right and extreme in the history. Of course, this uh, does not undermine the fact that Israeli successive Israeli governments have carried out similar policies. Uh, but of course, at this time, this new administration is of some concern. Uh, this is put on this uh, live stream. Uh, it is being live streamed on the Days of Palestine. Uh, it is being put on by the 16th of October Media Group, which is a group of young Palestinian activists and journalists who are seeking to report the truth about what is going on on the ground. Uh, today we have Diana Butu, who is a lawyer, former adv uh, legal advisor to the Palestine Liberation Organization, mm -hmm. PLO, and current fellow at Dawn Democracy for the Arab World Now. We have Miko Peled, who is an Israeli activist for Palestinian human rights. He is the author of The General Sun, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine and Injustice, The Story of the Holy Land Fi uh, Foundation 5. We also have later on, who was, will join us, uh, Dr. Abdullah Marouf, who works currently as an assistant professor at Istanbul 29 Mayus uh, University. Um, in Turkey. He also holds a PhD in Islamic Jerusalem studies from the University of Aberdeen in the United Kingdom. Um, I think we'll kick this off by going to Diana Butu um, to discuss perhaps some of the, uh, the, the angle here when it comes to international law with what the policies uh, that the new Israeli government is pursuing. Um, perhaps we'll talk as well uh, about uh, what this will mean with the policy of attempting to pursue the annexation of the West Bank, um, what that means in international law, what implications that would have. Um, of course, other policies which are being uh, pursued, like stripping Palestinian citizens of Israel of their citizenship for uh, disloyalty. Um, and there are a number of other different policies that are being pursued actively um, and have been pushed through uh, by the religious Zionism uh, party and their uh, members of the cabinet. They've also been given uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir and Bezalel Smotrich special powers in the West Bank, uh, which will have direct implications. So if you could just talk about some of the, uh, perhaps the, the side of this, which if we're going to look at it uh, from the perspective of perhaps international law, uh, what should the implications be for a number of these policies, such as annexing the West Bank, although we don't have uh, specifics as to whether that will be an annexation of the Jordan Valley. We've seen the idea by Netanyahu in the past in 2020 floated of annexing three major settlement blocks. Uh, what what does international law have to say about this and why is this uh, such a, a, a problem uh, when it comes to international law and what should be done about this as a consequence of their actions? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on the panel. And I also want to thank my co-panelists um, for the honor of uh, of having me be on alongside with you. Um, I think you started off with something that was very important, which is to say that, yes, this is the most right wing government, but that doesn't mean that these practices haven't been continuing throughout every single Israeli government. For example, if you look at just last year, the period where we had the Naftali Bennett and the Yair Lapid, the two um, parties that were viewed as the opposition to Netanyahu, the blocks as they would, as people would have you uh, imagine. We, it, we actually saw that Israel killed more Palestinians in the West Bank during that year than they had since 2005 during the period of the Intifada. So it doesn't matter if it's a so-called, and I use the word so-called uh, because there's nothing left about them. If it's a so-called left-wing government or this type of government, the policies are the same. The difference with this government is that this government only has in its sight going against Palestinians. It, it's not even trying to mask or put other issues at the forefront as we saw in previous Israeli governments, but this government is only aimed at, at uh, directing their attacks at Palestinians. That's it, that's their entire government platform. And that's why we've seen just within the past two weeks that this government has been in place 
everything from um, killing of Israel, killing Palestinians on a daily basis. There have been more Palestinians killed this year than there were in 2022. And 2022, I already told you, was the bloodiest year in the West Bank since 2005. We've also seen that Israel has announced that they're going to continue their plans of ethnically cleansing Safariyata, as well as other Palestinian towns and villages. They've already announced that they're going to be building and expanding more settlements in the West Bank, including things for tourism, as they as they have uh, put it. We've already seen that uh, that they have tried to ban the raising of the Palestinian flag. We've already seen that Ben Gvir has made it clear that he's going to continue to go on to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, the Al-Harm al-Sharif. Um, we've seen just one and again, each of these policies come to fruition. And so your, qu your question, and that's only within two weeks. And so your question about what does international law say about this? International law is clear. International law is based on the idea that states cannot do whatever it is that they want to do, and they can't expand their territory through force. In other words, you can't steal another country. You can't build and expand settlements. Um, you can't you can't ethnically cleanse. These are all the basic one, two, threes of international law. So what international law says is that all settlements are illegal. International says that international law says that annexation is illegal. International law says that ethnic cleansing is illegal. International law says that that those who are living under military rule are, are supposed to be protected, not the other way around, not targeted. Um, international law says that that uh, Israel is not allowed to. Um, uh, to take Palestinian land for their own purposes. Um, and so international law is very clear. The problem here, Robert, isn't the lack of clarity of international law. The problem is that, is that international law, there is no such thing as an international police force that is out there making sure that laws are implemented in the same way that you see a police force in, in other areas. And so international law is really only done, enforced, when other states enforce it. And here lies the problem, is that there have been no states that are willing to enforce international law. Instead of applying sanctions or ostracizing Israel, as they should have done, not just with this government, but for more than seven decades, instead Israel has been coddled and one of the things that has been so surprising is that even with this government, a government that has made it clear that they believe in ethnic cleansing, they've made it clear this was their party platform. Um, when you look at the Likud party platform, that is the most progressive, and I'm using quotes, of the party platforms that are in this government. Even the Likud has said that they don't believe that Palestinians have a right to self-determination, that they don't have a right to statehood, they don't right, have a right to live in freedom. Instead of any of the countries around the world ostracizing this government, they've instead taken the, the approach of embracing it and, and using these sort of word salads of, of saying, we are gonna judge the government based on its actions, not based on its positions. And yet here we are two weeks into this government and we've already seen what its actions are and still no response by the international community. So going back to what international law is and is not about, it's clear and you don't need to be an international scholar to know that stealing land is illegal. You don't need to be an international scholar to know that you can't shoot kids who are standing on their rooftop um, you don't need to be an international scholar to know that you can't let a somebody that you've shot bleed to death at a checkpoint. It, you don't need to be an international scholar to know that uh, stealing somebody else's land and building a house in its place or ethnic cleansing is wrong. But yet the problem here has been that there are there's nobody that's willing to enforce what we all know to be what is right versus what is wrong.
Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll definitely come back to you because there's a number of questions uh, that I personally want to ask as follow-ups. Um, and uh, also, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions come in for you as well. So thank you for that. Um, next, we'll move over to Miko Pellet. Um, Miko, uh, what I wanted to ask you here is um, what we see happening perhaps uh, in, in the context of the we we see reports that have come out from Amnesty International, from Human Rights Watch, very lengthy reports which have called Israel an apartheid regime. Um, also, Betselem has come out and concluded the exact same thing. Um, at this point, we see that there are some protests against uh, the Netanyahu government um, with small contingents uh, of people that. Uh, proclaim I'm supposed to be on the Zionist left, who've come out with Palestinian flags. Um, do you see that there is any change or that this administration perhaps um, will be stopped by people uh, in the Israeli society at large? Or do you see this uh, government as a manifestation of the natural course, perhaps, of Zionism uh, going from, you know, uh, the... Uh, we sorted the Labour Party and uh, the era of labor and these uh, self-proclaimed leftists now going towards uh, what would be called or could be called the revisionist camp. And now even further right um, in order to, quote unquote, get the job done with finishing the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. I suppose that's a few different questions in one, uh, but perhaps if you could uh, address some of those uh, key issues. Sure, and thank you for thank you for inviting me, and it's great to be with us with all of you. You know, the issue of the protest. I was talking to Wafa about this a couple of days ago. Um, the Israelis are not protesting what we think uh, need to be demanded. They're protesting because they're afraid that their democracy, the Jewish democracy that exists within the apartheid regime, the Jewish Israeli privilege within that regime, might be affected by by this new government. They're not talking about the kind of uh, change, the kind of you know principles that we might be talking about. They're not talking about a liberated Palestine. They just don't want their own little privilege within the apartheid regime to be jeopardized in any way, shape, or form. And that's why we've seen 20, 30,000 people in Tel Aviv. And the fact that they actually did these protests in Tel Aviv is telling because, of course, Palestinians from other parts of the country, from, from the West Bank and so forth, can't attend. And uh, and I'm sure not sure they even wanted the you know those Palestinians uh, to be part of that. Um, so I think it's important to make that clear. These Israelis are protesting. They're not protesting for the, uh, for for real liberation of Palestine or for the Palestinian rights. They're worried about themselves. Um, and uh, you know, Diana mentioned the coddling of Netanyahu. I mean, before he even took office, between the election and he and the time he took office, he was on Jordan Peterson. He was on Bill Maher. He was on uh, Joe Olstein, which is this mega church, uh, you know, um, preacher. And he was on the on the networks, you know, as some expert talking about talk. You know, he's he's a hero. He's for some strange reason he's admired. And what he's done is he's of course established himself as some kind of a statesman. Um, what he did now with this new with this new um, coalition. Because he could have gone with, you know, he could have had that handy coalition that he wanted, really. He chose these guys, I think, number one, because he agrees with them ideologically. And the Ben Gvir, Smotrich, et cetera, are going to execute the kinds of things that he wants to be done, but he wants to make, he wants to be kind of the, the statesman uh, face of it all. They were showing a little clip of Ben Gvir marching into his office the other day. And there's a lineup of, you know, police honor guard as he walks by. And to think that this filthy, racist thug who has absolutely did nothing positive his entire life, he's a nobody. And he's walking and in his hands, he holds the keys to the life of every single Palestinian. And, you know, what they did was they created this new ministry for him called Ministry of National Security. I mean, this is a huge, huge accomplishment for him. He is now the king of this. He controls all the agencies that deal with the lives of Palestinians within 1948 and within the West Bank, because he's going to be in control of the, the Haris Hadud, you know, the, the Mishmar Gvul that are within the West Bank. Um, and he's already putting in, you know, different changes in the relationship between the government and the police. Um, I think we're going to see... Uh, uh, you know the the, diff the difference again also between 
this government and the others who are, of course, no, no, the, the, the apartheid regime was established, you know, as soon as Israel was established. The difference is that, you know, politicians make promises and they lie and nobody expects them to keep them. Zealots keep their promises. And these guys are zealots. So Itamar Ben Gvir, Bitzalel Smotrich, Hanam Ele, uh, Brofman, who is Ben Gvir's number two man, they are in to actually execute everything they believe in. And that's why, at this point, the life of every Palestinian is in danger, is in imminent danger, which is a new development. It's a far more extreme development. And my take on it is that I believe every person of conscience needs to demand, or the international community needs to demand, guarantees for the life, for the safety and security of Palestinians everywhere. They also have a new minister in a new ministry that was created for them, which is called the development of the Nakab in the Galilee. Development of the Nakab in the Galilee means getting rid of the Arabs. It means wiping out the Bedouin Palestinian communities in the Nakab, some 300,000 people, that's not a small community, and filling the Nakab with more Israeli settlements. And by the way, the Israeli settlements in the Nakab enjoy some of the highest standards of living among all Israelis. The Palestinian Bedouins in the Nakab suffer from the worst poverty among Israeli citizens. Uh, and they want to, and of course, in the Galilee, they want to get rid of the Arabs in the Galilee because the Galilee still has a very strong uh, Palestinian flavor. Uh, they're going to touch, and I think he already has, the conditions of prisoners, which is, again, under the, under the authority of, of Ben Gvir. Um, shooting, um, uh, when, uh, shooting you know, children who throw rocks immediately, demanding the death penalty to all security prisoners. These are things that they're going to, these are things that they're actually going to um, execute because they're zealots. They didn't make a, they make promises in order to then get elected and then do whatever, whatever works. They made promises that they are now going to keep. And I'll say this again. I've been mean, saying this mantra ever since, you know, this happened, this, the election came out. The international community has to demand the guarantees for the safety and security of every Palestinian from this point on. There has that has to be the demand because the, the life of Palestinians is in imminent danger. Everyone from uh, Diana sitting in Haifa to Isa Amr sitting in Al-Khalil in, in Hebron and everybody in between. Um, you know, home demolitions, we haven't seen anything yet. You know, this year, like Diana mentioned, was a record year in terms of the killing of Palestinians. We haven't seen anything yet, you know. So I strongly, strongly believe that this is this is now has to be the number one campaign, demanding guarantees for the safety and security of Palestinians everywhere. We haven't even touched on Gaza. We haven't even touched on the Gaza Strip and the kind of and the kind of the kind of bombing and the kind of um, action that will be taken um, against against the Gaza Strip because they believe in wiping out the enemy. They believe in wiping out the threat from Gaza. And they were always criticizing previous governments for not doing enough. And we know what these previous governments have done in Gaza. So um, this has to be, I believe, the, the, our, our focus to demand these guarantees somehow. And then, of course, demand severe sanctions against the state of Israel altogether. Thank you so much for that, Nico. Uh, again, we'll come back to you soon. Um, and uh, we'll move on now uh, to our next guest, um, Dr. Abdullah Marouf. Um, so first of all, if I could ask you, um, because your expertise of, is, of course, uh, in uh, Jerusalem here, about the storming of Al-Aqsa Mosque by Itamar Ben-Gvir, um, and in general as well in the city of Jerusalem, the changes we are seeing, um, we're seeing, of course, uh, furthering the agenda of ethnically cleansing Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, uh, along with other areas, um, but specifically this point about uh, threatening the status quo at Laksa Mosque, what will uh, this mean uh, of threatening the status quo? Um, and perhaps as well, um, when it comes to addressing this issue, what what will this mean for the relationship perhaps uh, between Jordan um, and the Israeli government due to the Hashemite custodianship over that site? It, it seems to be threatened. Um, at this point, and we see that Jordan is to some extent lashing out at this. Um, so the dramatic changes that we perhaps will see soon on the ground uh, in Jerusalem, how do you see this panning out? Okay, um, thank you very much for, for this invitation. I would like to stress something very important here at the beginning. 
it is that uh, Itamar being Vigre and the religious uh, Zionism stream in the case it, uh, represented by Itamar being Vigre, Smotrich and all the other uh, members of this stream and this movement actually uh, do not actually hide the, the idea that changing the status quo in, in Al-Aqsa Mosque is, not, is, is on the top of their agenda. And that is something that they do not uh, even try to hide. Like the same as, for example, a few years ago when, when uh, uh, some ultra-right uh, movements, for example, used to, to try to cover up well, what they were uh, thinking of, of uh, changing the status quo. And uh, we know that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu had many times stressed uh, throughout the uh, years uh, that he uh, is not going to change the status quo, especially in 2015 when, when the riots started in Jerusalem and John Kerry the, uh, of the United States at that time came uh, to, the, to the region and uh, had these accords of the, the so-called Kerry Accords at that time. And during those accords, in these accords, uh, Kerry, the Israelis, and the Jordanians as well, in addition, in addition to the Palestinian Authority, stressed out that the status quo in Al-Aqsa Mosque shall not be changed. And by this, I might disagree with the identification or, 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 or sorry, the definition of status quo in this issue, because it's related not to the fact that that uh, that they defined uh, as being the right to the side uh, of of praying or the right of that side to to visit uh, this area, but uh, status quo means what to to have everything remains as it, as it was before the occupation. That means on the sixth of June, nineteen sixty seven, one day before the Israeli troops broke into the old city of Jerusalem and Al Aqsa Mosque. So this is very important to for us to understand. And to, to stress. So changing the status quo is not something that these people are hiding. No, they are actually stressing on it. And it was one of the main uh, key uh, points that uh, Itamar Ben Gvir uh, spoke about when, uh, uh, during his uh, campaign for, for the elections. So this is the dangerous part of, of, this, uh, uh, of this issue. Now, um, we know that we know that either uh, um, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir and uh, Smutrich actually uh, challenge the even the change uh, the chief rabbinate of Israel uh, with regard to the uh, to the ruling to the religious ruling of uh, uh, of banning Jews from entering Al Aqsa Mosque. And here I need to stress something very important. Uh, there is a misdefinition between the Palestinians or the Arab and Muslims side in a, to, to encounter to the Israeli side uh, as to what Al Aqsa Mosque is meant to uh, is meant by when uh, when when Muslims uh, refer to Al Aqsa they refer to the whole compound, to the whole enclave of uh, 144,000 square meters. So we're not speaking about this building on the south only. The building on the south is one part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That, is, that was stressed out by the Jordanian king, uh, Abdullah, and the uh, president of the, of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, in 2013, uh, in their uh, uh, accords of that time, and their treaty uh, of the cust uh, uh, custodian of the Jordanian king over uh, the holy sites of Jerusalem. So it is very important for us to note that a breaking into the sites uh, as a whole is, uh, is, is something considered as being uh, an, an unacceptable by the Muslims as well. In addition to that, the chief rabbinate of Israel and the uh, Haredim movement as well, and the Haredim uh, school of thought in, in, in Israel actually banned Jews from entering al -Assamu. So Itamar being fair is not only challenging the Muslims as well, challenging the Palestinians or the Arab or the Muslim world or even the international world is only. They are, they, they are challenging even the uh, chief rabbinate of the state of Israel. That is very important for us to understand. So what are they looking for in this issue? They're looking for uh, changing the whole 
status quo, for Aqsa Mosque, and change the situation, taking off all the custodianship of Jordan from uh, Aqsa Mosque, and banning uh, the uh, the Waqf, the Muslim Waqf, from working inside Aqsa, and making Aqsa Mosque being uh, uh, administered by the Ministry of Religions of, uh, uh, in, in the Israeli government. That is actually what Itamar ben is loudly speaking about, and I think that this could trigger a lot of a lot of problematic issues. First of all, Jordan has got the, cust uh, the the custody of Jordan is not an issue of of negotiation by Jordan. It is actually one of the main pillars of the of the uh, legitimacy of the Jordanian regime. So it's very important for Jordan to have the custodianship the custodianship uh, of of the king. Uh, oh, sorry, having the king as the being the custodian of the Al Aqsa Mosque and being protected as, uh, as, it, as uh, he is. And this is very important because it represents actually the legitimacy of Jordanian regime in Jordan itself, not only in, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And this is first. Second of all, we need to understand that taking such a, a delicate and a very sensitive area into this zone could trigger a religious war. And that is something that Israel... I think that there are some people of minds in Israel, such as, for example, the uh, I think that the security uh, uh, body in uh, in Israel, such as the the, the Shabak, are, are actually understanding uh, the the danger of of this uh, of this path. So I think they are trying to take over this issue. And here I need to finish up with with one uh, very interesting thought that was mentioned by uh, Ehud, uh, what's his name? Ehud Aglik, uh, the rabbi Ehud Aglik, who is considered as one of the uh, key uh, uh, figures of the, um, of the um, uh, uh, fanatic groups of the temple, as we call them in, in Arabic, Jama'at al-Haykal uh, in Arabic. These, the, this man said uh, clearly once that by taking the world to the edge of a religious war, we're actually taking the world towards peace. Because he believes that once the world is on the edge of a religious war, the Messiah would come. That is actually the thought that Itamar ben Gvir is bringing. Now, it was before, before um, a few years ago, this idea or these, uh, this ideology was actually be part of a very minority in the Israeli uh, street, but now they are controlling a very major uh, part of the government, and they are controlling the police themselves through the Ministry of of National Security that is uh, run now by Itamar Ben Gvir. This is the dangerous part of the whole thing because we know what happened in 2021 when 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 the, when the Israelis tried actually to touch upon Al Aqsa Mosque and the whole area, or in the Palestinians in the territories uh, of 48 in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in Jerusalem, and even outside uh, the, these territories were actually boiling up during that time. And I think that uh, Itamar ben Gvir has got this ideology and is pushing towards it. And this is the dangerous uh, part of it. So we're not dealing with the people who are, or with uh, a figure who has got some ideology and would like to try it. No, they have an ideology of pushing the whole world towards a religious war in order to bring out the Messiah. And that is actually not far away, in my opinion, not far away from the, uh, the ISIS uh, uh, ideology, but on the other side. And this is something very important for all the world to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah Maruf. Um, that was uh, uh, very, uh, I suppose, enlightening to uh, many people here. Um, and thank it was you. It's not too frightening. <laughs> Apologies, sorry. I hope it's not too frightening. Hopefully not. <laughs> it's too scary. So. Yeah, um, I, I mean, considering the times that we're in um, and, and what we actually see, um, there is uh, a threat on the table of, of something like this, a, a religious war um, erupting. Um, and specifically, I mean, uh, threatening uh, even relations with foreign states surrounding. Um, I want to bring this back to Diana Butu um, because um, there were a few questions that I did want to ask. Um, when we're looking at the current, uh, obviously, the government has only been here for two weeks, and you mentioned all of uh, the criminal acts of this new government just within a period of two weeks. Um, 
really we can trace back this, let's say, current round of violence uh, for you know, uh, lack of use of a better term, this is always used in uh, probably an improper w- a proper way here, um, to uh, dis- if we're going to track it back, could you track back the current round of, let's say, violence in the West Bank to the changing of uh, the open fire policy by the Israeli government before uh, when Naftali Bennett was in power? Um, and that was, of course, uh, followed by uh, then not only being able to shoot Palestinians uh, more easily, for instance, uh, when they do not pose an immediate threat. But after that, in February, we saw uh, the introduction of assassinations, um, the largest of its kind in the West Bank um, in 15 years uh, in Nablus, where um, free Palestinians uh, that uh, were said to be part of the Alexa Martyrs Brigades were killed in, in broad daylight. And this sort of made things spiral um out of control uh do you see this right now as a manifestation of what the previous government did um or do you s- see the situation as uh, dramatically different now under the new israeli government no not at all uh it's not at all different look um I want to back up in in some way we 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 tend to look for these artificial dates to talk about when there is a surge in Israel's killing of Palestinians. Um, And I think that that's the wrong way to look at things. The occupation is violent. To maintain an occupation requires violence. To steal one's house requires violence. To steal one's land requires violence. To um, to be able to imprison people requires violence. To kill people is obviously violent. Uh, all of the things to impose checkpoints, to maintain those checkpoints, all of that is violent. And, and so if you're looking as to when it, when this violence sort of traces itself back, it traces itself back to the formation of the state of Israel, 1948, because the only way that you can put a state in place of a people who were already here is through violence. Now they've had, there've been periods of time throughout history where we've seen that um, that new policies are in place, such as the ones that you've mentioned, the shoot to kill, the assassinations, but these are just um, <clears throat> add-ons to the already existing policy that Israel has of getting rid of as many Palestinians as it possibly can. And in order to do that, they come up with, um, you know, new rules, new regulations, new whatever. But I think that we shouldn't be, we, we shouldn't be bound by that. We definitely shouldn't fall into the trap of somehow saying that if they just got rid of the assassination policy, things would be better. It won't be because the, the occupation at its core is violent. Israel at its core is violent. If you look at Israel's history, from 1948 until the year 2023, we're now 75 years. In that 75 year period, there's only been a five and a half month period, five and a half months, where Israel didn't have some form of military rule imposed on Palestinians. So look at, from, you know, 75 years, five and a half months, at most five and a half months. That's it. So everything that Israel has ever done has been about violence. And and the the point of it is, is that, and this was the point I was making at the beginning, is it doesn't matter if it's a a right-wing government or a so-called left-wing government. We Palestinians are the ones who feel that on our skin and with our bodies. We are the one who, we are the ones who pay For Israel, we are the ones who pay the price. And the reason is, is that Israel is a country that is based on this idea of Jewish supremacy. And it doesn't matter if it's the left wing or the right wing. One thing that they all agree on is that there's this idea of Jewish supremacy. So who pays the price when you have a a system of supremacy? The people who are not in that in that group. And that's why um, when it comes to this past election, I've said this and I've written about this many a time, 
we are the ones who we Palestinians are the ones who pay the price because it's just this past election was just a question of how much more of a, of a supremacist society Israel is going to be. And Miko put it exactly correctly when he said people are not going to be going out and protesting the things that that Israel is doing to Palestinians. They're only going to go out and protest the slight, ever so slight changes that it may have to their own lives, that this that this government may have to their own lives. And believe me, it's going to be very small. When you have a, a government that's based on Jewish supremacy, it doesn't matter. Um, that if you're in part of the privileged class, they will always protect that privileged class. So the, the impact on Israelis is going to be absolutely minimal, if anything at all. We're the ones who are going to pay that price. Would you say somewhat it's uh, this new Israeli government has a sort of Donald Trump effect in that because it speaks so openly about what it seeks to do to the Palestinians, perhaps it does have, you know, it's escalating tensions. It is pursuing more hardline policies, um, as the, many of them, these policies have been outlined here, uh, but many have not. Um, but does it have that effect of they are just saying it and it seems outrageous? And so, for instance, we've seen some reaction. And um, especially from pro-Zionist groups around the world as well that sort of seem a little bit taken back by um, what this new government is saying. And then a lot of people seem to be uh, framing this um, as if this is where um, the evil against Palestinians begins and this is unacceptable. Um, would you say that that is a fair characterization, that it's a, a sort of Donald Trump effect that, it you know, they're saying the quiet bit out loud? Um, or would you characterize it in a different way? Definitely. Look, there has <laughs> there hasn't been a single Israeli government that hasn't uh, hasn't been loud about what it what their policies are towards Palestinians, and and uh, and that's the problem is that they're very honest in their approach towards Palestinians, but the world somehow prefers to have blinders on and pretend uh, that there's some you know myth out there that is that there is a good Israel. Um, and so it doesn't matter whether it was, yeah, you're, you know, Yair Lapid came out and said, my father didn't come to this country to be ruled by Arabs. Um, yeah, Yair Lapid also was the one who came out and said that he didn't believe that, that Palestinians should have a state. Uh, it was, what's his name? Um, Netanyahu has come out very clearly and said, self-determination exists only for, for, uh, for Jewish people. Um, they've made it clear they don't believe in Palestinian freedom, Palestinian statehood. I mean, they've been, they, it's not like they're sort of slightly whispering it and you have to read code. They're very bold about it. In fact, I would venture to say that Donald Trump actually learned from the Israelis rather than the other way around. Um, his, his boldness is, is because he saw that it worked around the world, uh, in particular in places like India, and, and in Israel, where with, with the Israelis, the Israelis have been absolutely clear about what their what their vision is. Again, the difference this time when it comes to this government, the only difference is that previous governments would attack Palestinians, but there was always another type of agenda out there, like, for example, fiscally conservative, um, uh, changing the taxation policy, uh, enacting policies when, it, when in regards to um, children and education and those sorts of things. This government doesn't believe in any of that. None of the party platforms even talk about economics or about the rights of individuals. It's all and exclusively about Palestinians. That's the difference. So when you have a government that is exclusively about Palestinians, it is not at all surprising that all of their actions are going to be against whom? Against Palestinians. That's why we see what we've been seeing. And even these changes that um, some people, and this might be too much in the weeds for, for the people who are um, attending this webinar, even the, the changes that Israel is proposing when it comes to the judiciary, the, the impact of it is twofold. One is to protect Netanyahu from being prosecuted um, because he's a criminal. Uh, but again, fiscal criminal, not for the crimes that he's committed against Palestinians. But the second is to be able to facilitate Israel's annexation of, of the West Bank. That's it. So every action that this government is taking 
is solely directed against against um, crushing Palestinians. They, they don't have another policy that they can fall back on, that they can hide behind and say, well, at least we're good when it comes to the economy. That's not what this government's about. But when it comes to the, the question of an, uh, annexing the West Bank, obviously we don't have um, anything solid in terms of where they want to take, but we do have that pledge. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, like yeah, that that's uh, the thing. If if they were to implement this, um, would this not be problematic for them on the ground? And also, can they do it? Um, in the like, if you look at the past uh, Israeli attempt to do it under Netanyahu, I believe in two thousand and nineteen, he backed off from it, and he used the excuse that the normalization agreements with the UAE and Bahrain at the time had stopped that. Um, but really, there was some pushback that I knew about from uh, the European Union states. Um, do you think that due to some degree of international pressure that a step like that could be prevented by international pressure? Or do you still think that it's too weak, too little, too late? Um, and if they a- attempt to do this and take this step, that they could get away with it? Look, the, it's, uh, it's let, let me be clear. Israel has already annexed the West Bank mm-hmm. and, and they don't have a problem with it. Israeli citizens don't have a problem with it. L- let me explain. There, I- there aren't two separate laws, two, there aren't two separate banking laws in place. There isn't a separate banking law that pertains to 48 versus the settlements. There isn't a, uh, a separate commercial code that relates to the West Bank versus the settlements. Uh, there isn't a separate real estate law that relates to the West Bank versus, uh, versus uh, 48 versus the settlement. It doesn't exist. It's all one law that exists. So what does that mean? It means that they have effectively annexed. And that's what we've been saying from time, from the beginning of time to, to the current day is that Israel has already annexed it. Now, the reason that there was such an uproar in the year 2020 was that Netanyahu wanted to take the step of formally annexing it. And that's where the world community came came in and said, whoa, you can do everything you want to do, but don't do it formally. And he learned that lesson. He learned that lesson very well, which is just keep going in the same pattern, same pattern. Why do I need to do formally when I can what I've already done informally? Why do I need to um, tie the knot and say that this is a formal annexation when I've already informally annexed it. Now you asked about Israeli society. Israeli society doesn't give two hoots about Palestinians at all. And uh, and this is why there's so many of us who've been calling for the strengthening of the BDS movement, that it's only when Israelis begin to pay a price where they're not be able to able to travel visa free to different countries around the world and now soon to be the United States. It's when they begin to pay a price, just in the same way that well, that South Africans were paying a price for their apartheid. Otherwise, they remain in this in this state of um, don't careism. It's not oblivion. It's that they don't care. They know what's happening. They're they're they go to the army. They actually know what's happening, uh, but they choose to ignore it because they don't care. Now, one thing that's interesting that I've seen just in my time uh, being here in Palestine is that. You and I and others will talk about the words racism and apartheid, and both of those words have a negative connotation. If I were to say somebody is a racist, you would, you you know, you'd think that it's bad. If you say that a a regime is an apartheid regime, it conjures up bad. In Israel, it doesn't. There are people who understand what it means to be racist, and they say we're proud of it. And they'll say, we are proud that this is an apartheid state. Sometimes they quibble over the definition, but then it gets, it eventually turns around and says, well, we're proud of it. What's the problem? So, you know, you're really effectively talking about um, a society that has been not only coddled, but been able to have its cake and eat it too, and, uh, and get away literally with murder, literally with ethnic cleansing and still continues to get applause from from the world. They still are able to travel visa-free. They still are able to participate in in various sporting matches. They're still able to participate in Eurovision. All of the things that apartheid South Africa was unable to do. Yeah, this this is uh, something that uh, I think people don't uh, bring up enough. 
uh, is that, you know, the reality on the ground is what it is. And it's been like this for a long time. And um, there needs to be some opposition. There needs to be something there uh, to force Israel's hand, because, of course, it's not going to simply give Palestinians their rights. And from the society perspective as well, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, you have more extensive experience uh, in the country uh, than I do. But I know from uh, being there many times and and, uh, and living there for a short period as well, um, that, you know, you're not going to get that from uh, the society either, uh, that pushback. Um, something that w- I wanted to ask you, Miko, um, was that now we're seeing uh, quite a bit of pushback from Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid against the uh, Netanyahu government. But more so, you know, if you actually read what they're actually saying, of course, there's the elements of the legal system. But when they're talking about the West Bank and West Bank policy, they're almost scared, it seems, that the West Bank policy is too reckless for them and that the approach that Itamar Ben-Vir and Bezal of Smotrich want is going to cause unwanted harm to settlers and soldiers because of uh, reaction from uh, the small armed factions which have formed there uh, out of basic desperation uh, lately. How do, how do you see that and, and why do you think it is that you do see this uh, backlash from some people in the Israeli military establishment um, and also, you know, uh, the opposition, so Yair Lapid and, and Benny Gantz, when it comes to West Bank policy and the way that they're going about it? I think your uh, mic is... <laughs> yeah, let, let me give you an example that really, uh, really crystallizes this. So uh, we're all familiar with J Street, and J Street had their conference here in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago. And Jeremy Ben Ami, who uh, Jim, Jeremy Ben Ami, who is the head of J Street, gave this talk, pretty much echoing what the Ganses and the Lapides were saying. And then he said something very interesting that I I think very few people were able to understand or appreciate. He quoted Gadi Eisenkot, who was a previous uh, chief of the Israeli military. And apparently, Gaidi Azenkot, along with some others, um, said that, you know, is m- millions of Israelis need to be coming out on the street uh, to protest, you know, the infringement of the rights, the, 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 the disastrous effects on uh, the Jewish democracy. And of course, he, he cares about the privilege that Jews live with him. And I thought it is so telling that he brings up Gadi Eisenkot. Gadi Eisenkot was chief of staff during the Gaza march of return. His soldiers were shooting at unarmed protesters in Gaza who are demanding freedom and democracy. And he is the one that is being brought up as some kind of a champion for people to go out and march and, and demand rights. And it was so cynical. But it was so characteristic of this, you know, the kind of the Zionist left or the liberal Zionist, you know. And that is how they show that they are somehow different than the Ben Gvirs. And the truth is that just that one example, using Guy the Eisenkot, of all people, the man who led the charge against the, uh, the Gazans who were marching during the March of Return, the one who was behind all the killing and the shooting, this brutality that took place. Um, but they have to create some kind of a you know space between them and Ben Gvir. The truth is, they are the fig leaf that allows Ben Gvir to flourish, because as long as there is this myth that there could someday somehow be a kinder, gentler Israel, is what allowed the Ben Gvirs to get to the point that they are today. Um, <clears throat> and that's I think that that's that's really what this is all about. I, you know, I want to go back, if you allow me just a second, something that Dr. Abdullah was talking about in, in terms of Al-Aqsa and Jerusalem. There's no question that this, this block of the Ben Gvir Smutrich people, um, the taking of Al-Aqsa and the de-Arabizing of Jerusalem or the, or the Judaization of Jerusalem is key, is the main pillar of their agenda. Now, during a couple of visits that I, that a couple of times that I was in Jerusalem, I actually walked in and did the tour of Al-Aqsa with them, just to see what this was about. The last time was in August during Tisha B'Av, which is the day the Jews commemorate the destruction of the temple. So there were extra thousands and thousands that were walking through. And of course they pray, and of course they do whatever they want. And there were, I don't know, thousands of, of, of armed police there protecting 
you know, these um, these people. And it, it, people used to think, or it used to be kind of believed that the whole Alexa thing, building of the temple thing, is a bunch of, you know, unimportant fringe uh, lunatics. The truth is that, you know, 50, 60, 80,000 Israelis, just regular Israelis, secular Israelis go on these tours every year now that are led by, you know, the Ben Gvir Smotrich types, you know, by these settlers. And, um, you know, there's a term that's been coined now, the Hebronization of Alexa, because what they did in, in, in the Ibrahimi Mosque, which is take more and more and more and more of the mosque and allow and give extra privileges to Jews is precisely what they're going to see, what, what we're going to see now in Al-Aqsa. And um, they don't care about the Waqf, they don't care about the, the about Jordans, they don't care about any of that stuff. If this brings on a war, they're fine with it. But they are going to eventually create a space for Jews to pray and gradually take more and more space within the compound to the point that maybe all that's left is Al-Aqsa, is the mosque itself, if that, if that. And there's no reason to explain just how dangerous this is. And where's Israeli society on all this? I mean, where's the regular secular Israeli society on all this? I remember, as I've been, you know, looking at this, what's happening in Jerusalem, I remember as a child, you know, singing songs about building the temple. I grew up a completely secular Israeli Zionist. What do we care about the temple? When we ask, if you ask Israelis, what is the most iconic thing you remember from the 1967 war? It's when the commander of the forces that uh, occupied Jerusalem said over the microphone, said over the speaker, Harabait Biadenu. The temple mount is in our hands. He's a secular Israeli. He probably never prayed in his life. What does he care about, uh, about Harabait? It is a national symbol. And Israelis, the most secular, non-religious Israelis, want to see a temple built. This is part of a national vision. It's a national symbol. And these, and typically of how the Zionist governments have been working throughout, the, you know, even before the state was established, you have a group of zealots who lead the way in the 1940s, uh, and you know, leading up to 48, 49, 50, it was young people like my father who joined the militias, the Zionist militias, and, and did all this. And the government is just a step back watching them and then embraces what they did. And that's precisely what we're going to see in Al-Aqsa. And that's precisely why I say again and again and again, the international community must demand guarantees, guarantees to the safety of security of Palestinians and guarantees to the safety and security around the Al-Aqsa compound and, you know, in the old city. And as you walk through the old city, by the way, as you walk through the Muslim quarter, you see more and more and more homes taken by settlers. Now, forget Silwan. Silwan is going to be, he's already, of course, you know, there's lots of settlers there. It's a war zone. It's a frightening place to walk through. You know, Silwan is right out of the walls. It's just below the old city. It's going to be flooded with, 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 um, with settlers, and we're going to see massive expulsions. Forget Sheikh Jarrah. Forget Sheikh Jarrah, the beautiful homes of this beautiful Palestinian neighborhood is going to be demolished and they're building high rises for, for settlers. This is now what is going to happen and they don't care what the international community says or thinks or doesn't think. They don't care about the Muslim world. And I think this is precisely, um, and, and of course the ben, uh, Benny Gantzes of, of, of the world and Ariel Peters, they're not going to care. And the Jeremy, and the Jeremy Ben Amis, they're going to nod. They're going to say maybe it's wrong, maybe it's this. But I want to say one more thing about that. Last year, not this last, uh, you know, Hanukkah is around December, the holiday of Hanukkah, where we light, we light the menorah. Last year, the president of the state of Israel, Herzog, which is his name and his family and his tradition is kind of the, they're like the icon of the more sensible, reasonable Zionists. He went to the Ibrahimi Mosque to light the candle in the synagogue that was built there with the worst, the most racist, Arab-hating, gun-toting, violent settlers. And that was a meeting. That was a marriage. That was the kind of the circle, if you will, closing the circle, if you will, between the myth of the Zi of, of kind of the liberal, sensible Zionists and the Ben Gvir types who live in Hebron and they live in Kiyat Arba and so forth. When he, this man, with his legacy, 
went to Hebron. I mean, he could have lit the, anywhere, right? He could have gone anywhere. He went to the to the center of this hornet's nest where there's nothing but hatred and violence. Nothing but hatred and violence for the settlers in that city. There's only settlers in Hebron. And that's the people that he went to, you know, give the honor of a president of the president of the, uh, the president of the president, you know. And I think that's it. I think people need to realize this whole myth of an Israeli society that is somehow liberal, this whole myth of the existence of a liberal Zionism is a complete myth and has to be thrown out, tossed out. Zionism, as we see it today, the Ben Gvir types who adore Kahana and adore Baruch Goldstein and think that murdering Arabs in cold blood is heroism, this is Israel. It's always been Israel, but now it's, it's more clear. And that is why the international community needs to now act. They need to act now. And we need to demand it with every voice, with every article, with every interview. Guarantees to the safety and security of Palestinians. And sanctions, severe sanctions against the state of Israel. Severe sanctions. And by the way, when we're talking about uh, annexing, annexing Area C, the man who believes there should not be any civil administration and who preached against the dismantling of the civil administration is now in charge of the civil administration within the Ministry of Defense, and that's Bezalel Smotrich. He wants to do away with the civil administration, and he wants all Palestinians, as he said many times, to either live as residents without rights, leave, or fight and be killed. That's it. And this is precisely where this is going. I think that's a, a good note to end on there. I'm sure there's a lot that could be elaborated on here with uh, all of the guests on this panel. Um, and uh, perhaps maybe this uh, should be done again in the future to elaborate on more of these issues because, um, you know, uh, there is a lot that we could expand upon. Um, and it's been a pleasure as well to be part of this uh, with each and every one of you. So I want to thank you for being on here. I want to also uh Thank the 16th of October group as well for putting this on um, and we'll end this here. So thank you everyone for attending and watching this and uh, everybody have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.